the followers of Jesus, when they saw the chaos, the noise, the stampede, when they heard the, the coins flying and the probably the, the lowing of the cattle and the flapping of the pigeons and the bleeding of the goats and the sheep, when, he, when they heard the noise and they saw the absolute chaos of the scene, it says in the scriptures that they remembered a psalm of David. What came to mind in the moment of this wildness was a psalm of David, a psalm written by King David. And that psalm, that psalm that they remembered, psalm, from Psalm 69, it says that in, in John 2, 17, it says, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. I thank you that, God, a word that King David penned under the inspiration of your spirit, a psalm that he wrote from the depths of his soul, would speak to disciples thousands of years later when they are witnessing, they are witnessing the Messiah at work in the world. And I thank you that even now, thousands of years later, we can hear those words and realize that your spirit has been speaking them, speaking them, speaking them from the beginning. You have had a purpose and a plan for your people. And tonight we come under your authority and under your word and into your house and we say, Spirit, speak. Speak the word you have been speaking to your people from the beginning and let our hearts perceive, our minds perceive, and our eyes perceive what you are doing and saying here in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, John 2, the Gospel of John. I'm going to read you this passage. I've always loved this story, this particular passage, because I love to see Jesus and what he's doing. And so what I want to encourage us all is to watch Jesus. Whenever we see Jesus, we look at Jesus. We are called to identify with Jesus. So watch him. Watch what he's doing. Listen to what he's saying. It says in John 2, verse 13, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, or pigeons, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now, a little, little bit of background here. Passover, this time of year when all of the Israelites, all of the people of God, they are celebrating and remembering how God brought them out of slavery from Egypt. When he passed over, there was the, you know, remember they painted the door frames with lamb's blood. It was a prophetic sign, of course, that they didn't fully understand. But we can look back and see that God was preparing the, pass, the ultimate Passover sacrifice in Jesus, in the Messiah. So they are going up every year to remember in anticipation of a coming Messiah. And Jesus is also going up for Passover into Jerusalem. It would have been filled filled with Jews from all different nations and countries coming into the city. They would have been saving up, preparing to go to this Passover time. And because people from different nations would have different currencies, and because they need to come into the temple and offer sacrifices under the old covenant system, they would be offering animal sacrifices, they would need to purchase the cattle if they were very poor, doves or pigeons. They would um, purchase sheep. So there was like a price point system. <laughs> You're very wealthy, you can purchase a whole cattle and you can sacrifice it. They've got all these different currencies and it was the temple law that you couldn't use the currency of your own country, you had to use the currency of Jerusalem. And so they're coming with their money and the outer courts of the temple, which is known as the court of the Gentiles, this is where non-Jewish believers would come to offer prayers. That area that is reserved for prayers and outsiders welcomed into the temple. It's filled with tables and cattle and sheep and doves. And the people sitting at tables exchanging money, they're not just exchanging currency, they're adding a tax on top of it. They are adding a little bit for their own pockets. So there's a temple tax, but then there's also an exchange tax. 
I was saying to Lance, it's a little bit like when you go to Disneyland and you're charged $10 for a cup of coffee. A little bit like that, like it, you know it's not costing that. So the very place where people are called to come and meet with God has become, in the outer courts, a place of bartering, exchanging, and business. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people, think about it, just think about it, the place where people are called, outsiders are called to meet with God and offer prayers has become a place where there is selling and usury going on. So, what does Jesus do? He made a whip out of cords. This would take some time. He saw what was going on, and he probably sat down and started braiding some grasses or vines together and made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. Imagine the noise. And these animals, all he would have had to do is crack it, and at the sound of it, they would have started stampeding out. And imagine, you're somebody there selling, and all of a sudden your animals are flying out of the courts into the streets, and it would have been filled with people in the streets. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. What they're, he just flips it. He just overturns the very tables on which they are doing business. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. That word, zeal, it is a small, hot word. The word in the Hebrew has a very similar meaning in the Greek. So it's not as if when we hear, you know, remember in Isaiah where there's all these prophecies about the Messiah, and it says the zeal of the Lord will accomplish it. Or it says the zeal for, um, even in the Psalm of David, Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Or he wraps himself in zeal like a cloak. That word comes from a word that means hot or boiling or red or passion. So it's just a full-on fervent passion. It can also mean jealous. So when we hear about God being a jealous God, that it, those words are interchangeable. It's a Hebrew word, kana. In the Greek, it's a word, uh, it actually sounds a lot like zeal, zelo or zeo, and it all has to do with passion, jealousy, fervent adoration, complete devotion, and heat. There's heat in it. It is a hot, small word. I was thinking about the word zeal. It's a, it's a Bible-y word. You don't hear a lot of people walking around saying, I just feel so zealous today, or wow, I'm full of zeal. You just don't hear it. And I thought, you know, bring back zeal. And then I thought, no, actually, bring back zeal. <laughs> bring back zeal. And that's kind of the core of what I've, I'm feeling God speaking, has been speaking to me, and I want to I wanna bring, um, bring that from his word tonight. Bring back zeal. Um, so the word zeal. I, as I was thinking about the ways in which God's zeal is communicated in the scriptures, I was thinking about how, um, how the church was birthed. At the very start, the church, out of which we are still a part, we, we are part of that same church. It was birthed on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God poured out on a group of believers in Jesus who were waiting in an upper room fasting and praying, and the Holy Spirit comes and lights them up. It says like tongues of fire were resting on their heads, and they go out, out of that, that upper room into the streets, and they start proclaiming the good news of Jesus, and thousands come to faith in Jesus. Zeal was poured out on them by the Spirit, and they were filled and consumed with zeal, and out they go out of that room, and the good news pours out of them. Because once you are filled with the zeal, the zeal must get out. That is something to think about. If you are filled with the zeal of God, it must come out. Other, well, it boils over. Let's just put it that way. And I was thinking about how the church has begun in zeal with the Spirit poured out. And over 
the thousands of years, the hundreds, the generations, how zeal has waxed and waned throughout the church. And because of the times we're in right now, I cannot think of a more, um, so I just can't think of a more appropriate thing to pray for in the body of Christ than the zeal of the Lord being poured out on his people. And I want to look a little bit about what that, what that means. I was, I've been reading a book um, by a fellow named Leonard Ravenhill. I don't know if anybody's read any Leonard Ravenhill. There's this book he wrote called Why, Revi- Why Revival Tarries. Um, and he had a quote in there, and I thought, that's it. He said, as the church goes, so goes the world. Meaning, look at how things are going in the church, and it will then show you how things are going to go in the world. The church, um, as the watchman, if the watchman sleep, the enemy comes in, right? And so this idea that if we want, and do we not want to see God pour out a spirit of revival in the nations? Yes then where does he need to begin? In the church. And in the church, it's not just a building. He doesn't want to just pour out his spirit into a building. He wants to pour it out into his people. And he begins with the individual heart. So the very things we long for, the things we long to see in the earth, revival, we we sing it, we're singing it tonight, revival, we want to see your kingdom come. God wants to do that work first here. And then it spreads like, I, I, I don't want to use fire analogies tonight, but I'm going to do it anyway. It spreads like wildfire, and it moves out into the streets. So as the church goes, so goes the world. And I thought, all right, then we know how to pray. We pray for an outpouring of his Holy Spirit, and we pray for the zeal of the Lord to accomplish what he wants, to begin in the church and move it out. So, I... Um, began to think about how John the Apostle exiled to the island of Patmos because of his faith. Um, This would have been decades after Jesus died. He would have been an older man, a pastor. He's a pastor and apostle to these new baby churches that are spreading because the Roman Empire is persecuting the Jews and these Jews have become followers of Jesus and now they're scattering and these churches are springing up. And John, exiled to the island of Patmos, he writes the Revelation, the book of Revelation. And that, that book, Revelation, it just means um, the revealing of Jesus. That's what that book is. And he begins to receive these visions from God and he sees, I mean, he sees these amazing visions of Jesus on the throne and the Son of Man coming in glory and all sorts of wild bowls of wrath being poured out. But he also, under the inspiration of the Spirit, God's voice moves through him to write letters to some of these churches that he is overseeing. And he writes seven letters. And each of these churches, there's something different that Jesus is communicating to the churches. And in Revelation 3, he gets to the last of these churches And I want to read from this letter, and I I want to ask us all to hear, because this is the beautiful part of having the Word of God with us now. The Spirit of God was speaking to John on the island of Patmos and speaking through him to these churches. But he's speaking all, not just, you know, when you think of the church in Thyatira or Philadelphia, or these, he's actually speaking all of those words to us now. So we don't just say, well, that was for then. No, it's for now and it's for us if we have ears to hear and eyes to see. So listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying and just open yourself up to hearing what he might be speaking to you, um, to me, today. So in Revelation 3, and this is the church in Laodicea. And the church in Laodicea, a little bit about its just geographical location, it would be in modern-day Turkey, and it would have been the sort of Asian uh, area of the Roman Empire. And it's located in, right along the Lycus Valley. And it would be about um, 10 miles from the city of Colossae, so the book of Colossians, and about six miles from Hierapolis. They were known as the, the sister cities, three sister cities. And they were, Laodicea was the wealthiest of these cities. 
And it was known for a few things, and so listen for that when you hear the letter, because it would mean something even more to them than it would just to us, the average reader. They were known for being a, source, or a city of fashion, very on trend, so they, uh, their fashions would be the fashions to watch. It's weird to think of a city all those thousands of years ago as being the cool place, but Laodicea was wealthy, the wealthiest, uh, the Paris, the New York of those cities, on trend fashion. They, they had a medical university, and they were actually known for producing an, an eye salve that would be used for people suffering with eye problems. And uh, they were also the city that although they were quite wealthy, they lacked a, a, a water, a fresh water, direct water source. So they would pipe in water from, Hierapolis had these hot springs that were hot mineral waters, and they would pour off of the cliffs into the Lycus Valley, and they had this, um, I think it was like calcium carbonate, these white cliffs would have been very striking in this water, poured off hot, and they would be piped in through a series of stone, like stone aqueducts, those hot waters, and then from Colossae, they had a fresh water source, a cold fresh water source, and they would also pipe those waters in. By the time the waters arrived to Laodicea, they would be neither hot nor cold. In fact, they would be lukewarm to the point where if you drank some of that hot spring water, it would make you vomit because it was putrid by the time it arrived. So think about all that thing. They are fashion, very known for fashion. They are wealthy. They have this eye salve that's very popular in the empire at this medical university, and they have no water source that's direct, so they pipe it in from a distance, and by the time it arrives, it's putrid. So, John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, writes, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. That's who's writing the letter. It's Jesus. The amen, the let it be, the yes and amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning, the one who was there at the beginning, breathing out over the deep, calling creation into being. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. We say, whoa, that's harsh. But think about it in the context. They would instantly understand what that means. Now, we've heard this expression. If you've been around the church for any length of time, and even if you haven't, it's like, well, it's a bit of a lukewarm response or a bit of a lukewarm faith or I'm a lukewarm Christian. I was rereading uh, Francis Chan's book, Crazy Love. came out in 2008. If you've, anybody ever read Francis Love's Crazy, uh, Francis Chan's Crazy Love? I want to say don't ever read it because you can be convicted, so read it. Um, he has a chapter in the book called Profile of the Lukewarm. And I want to read you a little bit of it, and I want to warn you because this has the effect. You know when you stay in a hotel and you go into the bathroom, you're like, oh, I'm in this hotel, it's great. And then you see that really high magnification shaving mirror that's attached to the, the thing, and you're like... <gasps> I'm hideous, you know, that sort of feeling of like all your pores, every blemish, every flaw is right there, and you're like, no, my life. Reading this profile of the lukewarm had the effect of looking into one of those high magnification shaving mirrors, and, um, and it's supposed to. It's supposed to. So when I read this, do not hear me reading it. Do not even hear Francis Chan writing it. Put it up against your own heart. If we, want to, if we want to be people carrying what the Lord wants to do in the earth, we have to do a self-checkup. That's part of what we do as believers and followers of Jesus. We go like, okay, I'm checking to see how my heart's doing. So brace yourselves for the magnifying hotel horror shaving mirror of the Spirit. Lukewarm people attend church fairly regularly. It is what ex is expected of them, what they believe good Christians do. So they go. Not so bad, okay, we're okay. Lukewarm people give money to charity and to the church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. If they have a little extra and it's easy and safe to give, they do so. After all, God loves a cheerful giver, right? Yeah, okay, so that's okay. Lukewarm people tend to choose what is popular over what is right when they are in conflict. They desire to fit in both at church and outside of church. 
They care more about what people think of their actions, like church attendance and giving, than what God thinks of their hearts and lives. A little bit of an ouch there. Lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. They don't genuinely hate sin and aren't truly sorry for it. They're merely sorry because God's going to punish them. Lukewarm people don't really believe that this new life Jesus offers is better than the old sinful one. Lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not act. They assume such action is for extreme Christians, not average ones. Lukewarm people call radical or zealous what Jesus expected of all his followers. How's the magnification going? I'm feeling it. Lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, coworkers, and friends. They don't want to be rejected. They don't want to offend people. Nor do they want to make people feel uncomfortable because, you know, we're Canadian. By talking about private issues like religion. Lukewarm people gauge their morality or goodness by comparing themselves to unbelievers. They feel satisfied that at least, you know, even if they're not hardcore for Jesus uh, as so-and-so, they're at least not as bad as so-and-so. Ooh. Lukewarm people say they love Jesus, and he is indeed a part of their lives, but a part. They give him a section of their time, part of their money and their thoughts, but he can't control their lives. It goes on. <laughs> it goes on. I started reading that list, and I was like, oh, oh. The one that really got me was lukewarm people tend to compare their own sinful, like, I'm not as sinful as so-and-so, comparing ourselves to the world. I felt extremely, it go, like I said, it goes on. I'm not even halfway through. And I was, each time, it was like the magnification got stronger and stronger. And I think that's good. I think that's good. I'm supposed to look at that and be honest about it. That word lukewarm, it means exactly what it sounds like. It's not hot, it's not cold, it's somewhere in the middle. And if I think about what God has been doing in his church in the last several years, he is, he is purifying his house. He is cleansing his temple. Why is he cleansing his temple? Why? I, I was like, Lord, why? Okay, why are you doing this? One, he is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is perfect. Sin cannot coexist in a happy way with the presence of God. It can't. It can't. Now, God's grace is relentless. It's unending. His love for us does not change when we are sinning or not sinning. His love is constant. He is constant. But I will say this, our experience of God's love is vastly changed whether or not we are walking our lives out in sinful patterns or not. I've heard so many people say, I just don't experience God's love. And I, the times when I have not experienced God's love, they have been in times when I've been walking in sin. I, don't, I can't experience the love of God when I'm over here and he is here. He cannot live with sin. So he comes to purify. It is his mission and mandate and purpose from the beginning. He is cleaning his house so he can dwell. He can dwell. I think about all of the stories that we've seen in headlines and news of celebrity pastors or, you, you know, you see these things and you're like, oh, it's just a tragedy. And it is a tragedy, but it is not surprising. God cleans his house, but he cleans his house here. We're not supposed to enjoy sin. Have you ever noticed that when you have Jesus in your life and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's really hard to enjoy sinning. It's really hard. You can sin and it might be like, oh, and then it's, it doesn't feel good. So you have to like move, get farther away from God in order to enjoy the sinful pattern. It's, it's brutal and it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be wrestling our way toward Jesus, and he wrestles with us in grace and love. So he does not want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be zealous, hot, passion for him, and cold and refreshing, like a cold, refreshing spring to the world. 
He wants us as one or the other. He does not want us somewhere in the middle. And he wants us constant in our zeal. Revelation 3 goes on and he says, For you say, I am rich. Remember the Laodiceans are rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. White garments, not the high fashions of the day. White, pure garments that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see, truly see. You hear how he's taking what they know and what they're famous for and he's saying, I have gold refined by fire. I have white garments of holiness. Come to me. He's not leaving them where they're at. He's calling them to himself. And he is speaking that to us today, constantly speaking that to us in great love. And then this verse, to those, to whom I, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Now, hear this. He does what he does because he is love, perfect, pure love. I always like to think of the scene of Jesus cleaning the temple out as like angry Jesus. Angry Jesus, finally angry Jesus is here to just kick some tables over and show them that he still gets in an Old Testament mood every once in a while. He's not just meek and mild, but that's not it. Everything he does is out of love. He is holy and he is a God of love. So if he is going and flipping tables, what is he doing? Those whom I love. In Deuteronomy, in Exodus, we hear, you will have no other gods before you. He's saying, no, no, no idols, no, the system of old sacrifice is done. Here I am. I am the Messiah. I am the one who will go to the cross and bear all of your sin, your sin and your sin and my sin, every sin I will take on myself and that system is done. The law is fulfilled. He's also saying, those whom I love, I struck a covenant with my people and I cannot undo my covenant because I am a faithful God. I am married to my people and we live like we are in an open marriage with God. You know, you see all these articles about polyamory and how it's the new thing and we look at the world as believers and we think, oh, you know, that's just awful, it's so sad. But we are living spiritually polyamorous lives with Jesus so often as his people. We have chosen pornography over the presence of God as his people. We have chosen the ways of the world over worship. We have chosen to spend our hours with, I don't know, is Candy Crush still a thing? Fill in whatever is the latest thing. Instead of spending time with Jesus, we have chosen these things and we go, eh, at least I don't do it as often as so-and-so. At least I don't That's not what we are called to. We are in a covenant relationship with our maker. And the bridegroom is preparing his bride and coming soon for his bride. And he is saying, enough, enough. You are not in an open marriage. I am zealous for you. I am a jealous God. Can you imagine if on my wedding day to Lance, I mean, we didn't have cell phones because it was, you know, horse and buggy days pretty much, but... um, (laughs) But can you imagine if, you know, Lance is waiting at the front of the church and I'm just going through old photos of like boys I used to like. Oh, just a second, I'll be right there. Oh, hey, I'm gonna text him, just see what he's up to. You know, oh, Kirk Cameron, oh, he was really cool in Growing Pains. Like, can you imagine if I was fixating on old loves And as we're standing at the altar, I'm like, just a second, a text is coming through from this guy I used to like. And would you say, oh, Lance, he must love her so much. He's just, you know, he's he's so patient with her. And he doesn't mind that she's calling these guys that she used to have crushes on. Would you say that he loved me then? No. So you understand when God is a jealous God, he's saying, I will not have it that way. I will come after you with my love and draw you to myself. In Hosea, beautiful prophetic book, he allures, I mean, he tells Hosea the prophet to marry a woman who he knows will be unfaithful to him to show the heart of God. God goes after his bride. He goes after his bride and draws his bride to him. To those whom I love, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Those words mean 
I let your flaws be seen and the ways you miss the mark. I let your sin be seen, and I teach you like a parent teaches a child. It's not harsh. It's a gentle instruction. He does it out of love to show us this is the way to walk. And then he says, so be zealous and repent. I'm like, oh, okay, just be zealous. Jesus, like what are we supposed to do? Grab flags and start running around the church until zeal, we go, so I'm feeling this, are you feeling the zeal? I'm not feeling it yet, but let's just keep going. That's not it. And I was praying about this. I was saying, Lord, be zealous, like just where's the zeal switch? And then we start yelling in tongues. I don't know, like you, you get what I'm saying. It's not as simple as just choosing the attitude of zeal. So I was praying about this and I thought, okay, what does it mean to be zealous and repent? To be zealous. And I thought, you know what? It comes back to the things we hear all the time, these basics of communion with God. So Jesus clears that temple. He clears those outer courts to make way for people who are far off from him to come near. And that gives us a clue right away. So one of the things, I just want to give you sort of practical application. If you're thinking, okay, I want zeal. I want to be closer. I want to be prepared for Jesus. One of the things that we can do very practically is get a revelation of Jesus. How do we do that? Spend time in the Gospels. One of, uh, uh, I was listening to somebody talk about uh, the necessity of keeping Jesus at the center of our attention. And so one of the things recommended was just whatever you're reading in the scriptures, always be reading the Gospels as well. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. All the scripture is pointing to Jesus. Look at Jesus. So Spend time in the Gospels daily. Just keep going. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then just start again. And just keep in the Gospels. Talk with your Father throughout the day. He is your Father who loves you. If you've had trouble with earthly fathers, He is there to restore a right relationship and understanding of your Heavenly Father. Talk to Him. And don't just talk to Him in the, help me. Those are good. He likes those. He can take that. But He also says, like, just talk with me. Talk with me. Not just in the morning. Not just you know, in the traffic. They talk to me throughout the day. Talk to your father. Make a practice of it. It sometimes takes a while to make it a habit. Um, receive from the Spirit. This is a prayer that I just encourage you to pray. Just, put, just right now, just put your hands out in front of you. you have hand, if you have hands, put them out in front of you. What if you began your day by saying, come Holy Spirit, and just listening and receiving Sometimes we're just like this, clasped and like, here's my list, I need you. But what if we started with, come Holy Spirit, and waited for him to speak and receive from the Holy Spirit? Let's just close our eyes right now. Just close your eyes and just put your hands out in front of you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak right now. You'd give something to us as your children. Show us, God. Show us your heart. Give us a word, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I encourage you to just do that. Just make a practice of that. Wait on the Lord. Receive from him. Worship God. It took me a long time to realize that it wasn't just at church where we're supposed to worship God, and worship is not just singing. Develop, cultivate a life of worship. Posture yourself in worship. It is not out there. It's not for only some to kneel down in worship, to bend, like bend your body low, get personal with him, get real, get raw, get low before the Lord, and just worship him in his holiness. And you think, what do I do? I can't sing. Just start declaring his holiness. Say, you are worthy. You are holy. Jesus, you are my redeemer. I thank you for what you have done for me. I thank you, God. Begin thanking him. Just pour out your worship to him. And hear the word. Read the word. Eat the word. And then Ta-da, do what it says. <laughs> do what it says. In James, it says, don't just hear the word. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. As we walk in obedience, we experience the love of the Father. 
God asks for our obedience. It's a mystery to me that Jesus tells his disciples in John 15, this is love for me, to obey my commands. And you think, well, that seems awfully demanding. He knows, though, he knows that as we walk in his way, we are close to the way who is Jesus. And we experience his love as we obey him. You say, well, that's hard. I don't want to always obey him. I know. I'm human too. Sometimes God tells me to do things. I'm like, oh, really? And he doesn't love us any less when we don't obey. That's the miracle. But our experience of his love is in direct correlation with our obedience. It's amazing to me, his grace, and also how profound it is to experience his love when we walk with him closely. And then that word that, it's a hard one, repent. There's a reason that he says, be zealous and repent. Because if we are walking in sin, if, we, if our outer courts, so to speak, of our hearts are populated with obstacles, how does the king, we say, come Holy Spirit. He's saying, will you let me? clear your tables and flip them over and get, that, get those obstacles out of the way. He desires to dwell. Will you invite him to flip your tables, so to speak? Will you invite him to just clear away the obstacles, the obsessions, the addictions, the patterns of sin that you know keep him from fully, fully, fully being your God? Repentance is a gift. It's a gift. It says it's a gift, the gift of repentance, because to repent and say, oh, Lord, I messed up, that is the place where he says, I'm here. I forgive you. It's gone. And now you're in right communion with him. And here is the beauty. Listen to this verse, in Revelation 3.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Those tables that held the money and they were being used to sell, that were keeping people out of that place of communion with God, it becomes a table at which we feast with Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? It was just profound. I was looking at that. I will come in and eat with that person. It's no longer the obstacle. It's now the place of communion. It's beautiful. And here's the other thing. I so often looked at this verse and thought, oh, yeah, it's for people who don't yet know Jesus. No, this is for the church. This letter is written to believers. Jesus is on the outside of his church saying, I want to come in. Will you let me come in? I am knocking on the door now. Will you open the door? Will you, will you let me dress you? in garments that are white? Will you let me put salve and ointment on your eyes so you can see? Will you let me come in? And we say, yes, we want him in a church, but here's where it begins, right here, right here. As the church goes, so goes the world. As the human heart, as my heart and your heart goes, so goes the church. We want revival. We want to be See the zeal of the Lord accomplish all he has desired? Here, here. I, here I am, says Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. If I hear his voice, if you hear his voice, and if we open the door and say, come in, flip those tables, clear the way, he will come in and eat with us, and we will eat with him. Let's pray. Lord God, we desire to be zealous. And sometimes we just, we want it. We want you to do it. And we don't want to have, we just want to wait for it to happen. And God, I just believe that even right now you are asking your bride to commit, to say, I do, I need help. I need you to come in and clear off some obstacles I just want to pray for anybody here who feels like they have, they have obstacles in the way and it's really terrifying to let go of them because they feel like they're a part of the personality or a part. Of, I just want to pray that Jesus would reveal himself as a God who
who gives the gift of repentance, the gift of holiness, the gift of forgiveness, and the gift of renewal. Jesus, I thank you that there is nothing in our lives that is too shocking, too big, too ingrained, too secret, too hidden, too awful, too evil. Nothing is too much for you. You have paid for all our sins, and you say, I am extending to you my forgiveness. I will clothe you in white. So I just want to pray for anybody here who's feeling like they're just too much. They're too ingrained in sin. Right now, Jesus, I ask that you'd meet with that person and you'd come in. Help us to open the door to you in Jesus' name. I just want to pray for anybody here who feels lukewarm. Lord, that's all of us in some way where we just know you, you want more of our hearts. God, we, we know that you are zealous for your house and that means you're zealous for your people and you're zealous for us. Lord, fill us with your zeal. Fill us with your zeal. Draw us to wherever it is we need to come toward you and receive from you so that your zeal can be in us and move through us and pour out into the streets. Jesus, help us to be both hot and healing in in our passion for you and cold and refreshing to those in need. And Jesus, I just want to thank you that you are at work. You are building your church and your kingdom is coming. Let us be ready to receive you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, zeal for your house consumes you. May it consume us. May it consume us, Lord God. Amen.